Wow, that's a man. Jeez. All right. This is going to be a long night, guys. Apparently, I'm the only one here. Um, so, um, my name is Justin. I'm from Guava Pass. I apologize that you have to listen to me for the entire night because, uh, yeah, that's the way it's going to be. Um, so, what is this talk? This talk is basically about two years of Rails and Guava Pass, but it's more about how we as an organization have come up, um, the mistakes that we've made, and I want to give it back to you guys and expose our mistakes to you, only so that you guys can, one, learn, make decisions about how you guys affect your own organizations and take a little bit back at how we do things. All right, so who am I? I'm 34. Uh, my name is Justin Louie, CTO of Guava Pass. Born and raised in Seattle, I've been doing startups since I was 26 years old. Moved to Hong Kong around 29 because I was tired of my life in Seattle. Um, and then came over to Singapore to do Guava Pass with uh, Jeff and Rob, who are the founders. Um, and I, I, think, I like to think that these two pictures kind of represent who I am. On one side, I like to do you know serious things and pretend that I'm a, like this guy who's got it all together. But realistically, inside, I'm like just it's a party going on in my face, something like that. Okay, cool. So um, before we really dive into this talk, what is what is this talk about? It's it's our mistakes, and so I apologize if this talk is a little bit chaotic. Um, and it's supposed to be like that because a startup life is chaotic, and that's how our journeys really, really actually been. Um, and I, I, I want you to agree or disagree with some of the choices that we've made, and that's kind of the point, um, that maybe some of them you like, maybe them, some of them you, makes you angry. But if nothing else, it's our journey, and that's what I want to share with you guys. Um, so what is Guava Pass? Um, at, at the heart of Guava Pass, for those of you who don't know, um, we are a network of boxing, spinning, yoga studios, pole dancing for some, maybe, uh, me, uh, um, and it's, uh, you pay a subscription anywhere from $100 to 190 uh, sing. Um, depends which market you're in and what deal you got, so being real. Um, but you book a class and then you go and attend that class. So you go to the yoga studio and you go in. And we facilitate the lesson creation all the way to the booking. And um, so for us, um, Guava Pass was founded on March 15th, uh, launched a couple weeks thereafter. Um, not March 15th. March 2015. Um, and the first city was Singapore. Soon after, it was Bangkok, Dubai, Hong Kong. Um, today, we're in nine cities. We've opened up more, but we've also had to close down some cities. Um, always a sad time when we have to do stuff like that. But um, the cool stuff is we have two concepts, which is called Guava Labs and still boxing. They're inside the basement of the OUE building in downtown. Um, and uh, you can see a picture over here. This is our boxing concept. And so, for Guava Pass, this is kind of um, our heart, and it's being able to facilitate people having healthier lives and being able to exercise better and um, doing that across the world. It doesn't matter where you are in Southeast Asia. You're able to go and visit a studio that you know, is part of our network. And so who are the, who's the group behind it? Um, we call ourselves Devs, Dev Awesome. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, but uh, we've been on Rails for about two and a half years. Um, we've, through those nine cities, we're about 1,200 studios strong. Um, the cool number for me is this one. It's 910,000 completed bookings. So this is 910,000 visits people have made to various lessons and studios. And we're really proud of this because of all the health that we're, you know, living healthier lives. And I think um, some of the dev team has actually started, you know, to get in on that a little bit. Um, and of course, we've done 1.9 million lessons, so not every lesson has a booking in it. Um, and in the past year, we've had four nines of uptime, which is pretty good for a startup. Uh, I don't know. Okay, no one else is interested. Okay, cool. Um, so that's uh, the people, that's Guava Pass and the people behind it who run the technical side. So I'd like to run you through a timeline of how we came as a development side. And then what I'll do is I'll, I'll show you some very exposing and specific examples of the, the atrocities that we've committed against the, the code base. All right, here we go. Okay, so first commit. I got to actually write initial commit of guavapass.com. Um, initial commit of the blog, anyone? No? Okay, so the, the goal was literally anything to get it out. That was as fast as we can, build whatever, do whatever it takes. So what did, what did I do? I was the only guy in the beginning, so uh, what did I do? I put it on DigitalOcean, it was a one server 
machine running passenger MySQL on the same server. Kind of single point of failure, right? Um, and it was fast because it's all on the same machine. And it runs Capistrano 4.2, Rails, uh, decent test coverage, uh, which was the thing because by yourself, you, you kind of want to make sure that the stuff that you built isn't going to break later. Uh, at least that's how it started in the beginning. You can kind of see where my voice is going with this. Um, but a couple months later, um, as I said before, we totaled into four cities, uh, Singapore, Bangkok, Dubai, uh, Hong Kong. Uh, we got translations. Uh, here's an embarrassing picture of myself. As you can tell, I like to do these kind of things to my own person. Um, this is me getting married. And so, of course, being the only guy, um, and I'm born in Seattle, I had to go back to Seattle to get married. Uh, well, part of the wedding, right, uh, was in Seattle. And so what did that mean? That meant the only tech guy was on a plane for a while and asleep in not the same time zone. And so I had to teach the founders how to log in to DigitalOcean to, and click the reboot button, but not the destroy button, <laughs> right? And I, I don't know if you guys know, but this is two years ago, and you could destroy the servers, and there was no confirmation screen when you hit the destroy button. So you could do a destructive action and bring everything to a screen. Uh, anyways, yeah. So, um, and you know, the early days are the early days. So. Um, CSVs were cool up until they weren't, and then they would bring the whole website down, and so enters in delayed job and a second server, putting it into the background. Um, and of course, speed is another thing that happens. Feature changes come down the pipe like crazy. Um, by this time, we're in four cities, so we're getting people in the door. And so what's the first thing that dies is testing. And so feature changes didn't result in any good new tests, and so we were just flying by wire in the seat of our pants. Um, six months later, it became unsustainable for myself personally. Um, so enter Marcos, James, and Leon. Marcos and James are here. Uh, thank you guys for supporting me in my trying times. Um, but uh, we also added another three, technically four cities. Uh, sorry, that should be a four. Um, Shanghai, Melbourne, Melbourne, Sydney, and Taipei. Um, and some of the cool things was uh, we got off a delayed job, went into Sidekick, one of the caveats, of course, was that if you run a delayed sidekick through the active job interface, sometimes it can pick up the job faster than the, trans, uh, the, the actual commit has been transacted. Uh, and so the transaction has been committed, is what I wanted to say. But what that meant was th the background worker was picking up the job and there was no object there. It would go, where is this thing? It's not here. It would try again in one second and it would actually be there. Um, so that was fun to figure out what's going on. Uh, we, we took our first foray into React, building the Studio dashboard. So this is the dashboard that all our partner studios log into. Um, and then we actually started trying to put some redundancy into the system so that we wouldn't have a single point of failure. Got two HA proxy servers, uh, three front end, two back end. And our database was now run on RDS. Uh, the, 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 what is it? The people who read into this will notice that this is possibly still in DigitalOcean, which is what it was. And our database was in... Uh, in AWS, and the reason why we did that is because we were too cheap to pay for the entire stack of AWS. Um, part of the problems that we ran into was uh, every now and then for, at lunch, the site would go down for five to 10 minutes, seemingly randomly. Uh, and we you know, found out within a day or so that basically we were running a, back, a backup job. It was a script that, we, you know, that I downloaded. It's my fault, I apologize. Uh, is that would do a full table lock when the background job ran. So it would lock the whole database out and nothing could be written. And of course, all the servers are like, well, I'm just sitting here waiting. And then the site would go down. Um, but these are the kind of things that happen in an early stage, super, super early stage startup. Um, taking us to a little bit about July. Um, so we ran into that exact error that I was talking about where DigitalOcean and AWS, we had when you when you put your database in one location and put your front-end servers in another location. Up until that point, all of our uh, requests between the front-end servers and the back-end servers were running uh, less than one millisecond uh, full round trip time. It was great. Um, but then one day, uh, we're all at the, the gym, actually, and our webs we get pingdom alerts. We get new relic alerts. We're like, oh, crap, the website's down. Um, and we start investigating. And it turns out the link went to from less than one millisecond to about 100 millisecond round trip time. So 
you know, 20 calls all of a sudden starts taking two seconds and that compounds really fast. Um, and then so uh, what we did was we did an emergency migration from uh, AWS over to DigitalOcean to collate the co-locate the database um, to our front-end servers, and then we moved it all solely back over to AWS. And we decided, you know what, it's probably time to start paying this actual fee of uh, getting the nice, you know, uh, multi-zone AZ failover, stuff like that. Um, so this is a lot of uh, DevOps stuff, but it's kind of the stuff that is real when you're doing a startup. Um, and of course, now that we have more people being able to be on the team, we get better test coverage, which was you know, a benefit as we start to grow out. Okay, so everyone, everyone doing okay so far? All right, so here are some of the exposing things that I want you guys uh, to be able to see what's uh, going on in the background. So in the early days, uh, sorry this is a little hard to see. Um, I don't know if we can make this better by any means. This is the booking controller. Um, and you'll be able to see it in the slides, hopefully, afterwards. But the booking controller, this is creating the booking. So I go, I find a lesson that I want to join in my account, and I just hit book, and it hits this endpoint. So um, here's an example of just getting it done. Uh, we check for if the user is active. If they're not active, we send them someplace else. OK, cool. Uh, then the next thing we do is we try to update the user for some unknown reason. Uh, we check to see if the lesson is present and if the lesson is bookable. If the lesson is not bookable, we send you someplace else again. And then it gets to the really fun parts is uh, we, get the, we, get, we try to see if you've had a previous booking with this particular lesson. And instead of creating a new booking every time, we reuse that, that old booking. Uh, yeah. And so this is, uh, this is how I, I built it back in the day two years ago. Um, I'm not saying this is the best architecture to do things in. It's probably one of the worst. But um, it is what actually happened in some of the stuff that we did back in the day. Um, and of course, we now have to fight a lot of this particular uh, code these days. Um, another thing that we did was uh, we launched our mobile app. March 2016, um, we did our first foray into React Native, which was really fun. Great project, our second try into React. Um, and this time, um, we, what we did was instead of dealing with writing um, you know, modular code and you know, doing it dry, let's just copy and paste the code and make the modifications because we don't want to mess with the website, but we want to get the mobile app up and running as fast as possible. So we just copied the paste in the code and then would mod make the modifications we needed. Um, and as you can see, one of the things that results out of it over time is you try to build on top of this code base, and eventually you can't build on top of it, so you have to make a dot one, and then a two, and this just continues to compound. Um, to, here's here's uh, kind of the, the, the picture that explains the, the different versions that we've built. Um, you can see this is the version one folder. Um, it's this long, effectively. This is version 1.1. It's only this long, and version two is even shorter. So what this is effectively saying that we started building, and then we, made, we wanted to make a better API, but we couldn't have the full time to be able to convert the entire API over. So what this causes is your mobile app, our mobile app actually for different actions, asks for different endpoints um, on different versions. And ooh, that's, that's, uh, that's problematic. OK, cool. So, um, and then, you know, anytime you deal with a project that lasts a particular amount of time is you end up dealing with some of the, the code base that you've taken in. And I don't, I want to say this first and foremost, I'm not trying to knock the maintainers of this, these gems. Um, I just want to explain some of the things that we've run into. And this is, these are our difficulties. They're not difficulties that I think are across the board. And I don't, I think some of these gems, you definitely should use them. But these are the problems that we ran into. Um, active admin is a very divisive thing. Uh, people love it and hate it all at the same time um, because it's a DSL that you have to learn, and it's a complicated DSL. Uh, but once you've learned it, you can crank things out like crazy. Uh, uh, you just want it. They need a whole page into an object. Business needs that. Okay, ship it to them in less than a day um, kind of deal. Uh, we actually did a foray into using Administrate, and um, the problem... Administrate's beautiful, and for developers, it's great. Um, it feels good and makes you feel like you're in Rails again. The difficulty is that to build anything simple like filtering, you have to build the whole thing from the ground up. 
and it takes a long time. Whereas it's already done in Active Admin, you just do filter something and you've got it basically. Um, next one, Access Taggable is uh, really cool up until you try to join across uh, anywhere like say a couple thousand rows um, and you make those joins, it starts getting slow really fast. Um, Access Taggable has a uh, caching system built into it which works great until you need translations. And then the, tr the caching system breaks pretty fast because uh, it wasn't really built for that. Um, and that, that brings us to the next one, which is our Globalize. Uh, this one, Globalize, is cool for translations. And us being in Southeast Asia, we all have to deal with translations, I imagine. Uh, and it's not really rail ready for Rails 5. It's kind of in beta 2. And it's been like that since July. And so we're still kind of waiting for that to come along so we can upgrade our old code base to, to Rails 5. Um, we think they're pretty much ready, but you know we're going to have to do a lot of testing to make sure that the beta 2 works. Um, for our mobile app, Devise has a tokenization system, and they actually pulled it out of the original Devise code base. And we had to, that what came out of that was Devise token auth. And there's a couple of issues with sessions in it. Uh, specifically, we had to store all of our sessions in Redis. You can't store it on the user. Uh, it creates a bunch of 500 errors, at least for our code base it did. And so this is dangerous because that means Redis is now mission critical. Uh, if Redis goes down, we lose everything in terms of the user session. So they have to re-log in and they get angry and stuff like that. Um, so uh, we'd like to remove our dependency off of Redis being mission critical. Uh, that'd be nice one day. Uh, friendly ID is something uh, good for SEO, of course, at some point. Um, and we run into slug collisions all the time. Um, so you have to work around that, especially when, uh, for us, we have lessons that are named the same a lot because it's the same class, uh, yoga, 60 minutes at this studio. But you know it's, it's compounded over like 25 times kind of deal. So we run into a lot of slug collisions, and we've actually had to deal with um, how do we name things friendly, yet at the same time unique. All right, cool. So um, diving even slightly deeper, uh, actually pretty deep, into poor architectural decisions. So these are problems that I, um, I created for our team uh, two years ago. A uh, couple of them are, we don't reuse old booking objects. I mentioned the booking one uh, before. Uh, but specifically also what's killing us today is the subscription object. And uh, when you subscribe and then you cancel out and then you resubscribe, we use the old object. We don't create a new object for you when we should have been doing that. Um, part of the reason why we did it in the beginning was because of fraud. Uh, you know, People like to resubscribe a bunch of times trying to get better deals. I, I don't blame you. I'm just saying it's something the company would like to avoid. Um, and so uh, it's kind of shooting us in the foot today as far as uh, doing business analytics. Booking is, has a lack of a state machine. If you look at the table, it's just a bunch of flags. Uh, completed, uh, no-showed, late canceled, uh, notified, uh, canceled normally, and a bunch of different mutually exclusive states that uh, for some reason I didn't think to use a state machine back in the day. Um, and because the booking object is, touches so many different things, uh, it's, it's too much of a nightmare for us to be able to bring it up into a state machine. So we just deal with the problems of having it. And of course, if you get two flags that conflict, then you don't know what state the booking is in and you have to reconcile it all. Uh, poor naming, is, I think uh, every developer deals with this in general, but I'd like to explain one of ours. Uh, we have a couple tables, uh, objects, billing, billing charges, uh, billing item pricings. Uh, so the billing is just the user's billing. The billing charges is how we charge the user if they go happen to no-show or late cancel. OK, they're kind of related, not so bad. Billing item pricing is how we, our studio relationships, and have nothing to do with the user. I don't know why I named it that, but now we have this confusing naming. Every time I onboard someone, I'm like, I'm sorry, just they're not the same thing, they're not related. I apologize. All right, how are you guys doing? Here is probably the most damning one. Um, the one of the, uh, I'll just go into it. OK, here we go. The, uh, we, our referral objects has a generate token. So uh, I, I want to refer you. Uh, we generate your token for you, and then you can refer someone nicely. OK, so let's walk through this code. We generate the referral token. We have a loop. The token is based off of your user's first name, loves guava, so Justin loves guava, and a random digit. 
Uh, and we assume that there's not going to be a thousand Justins together. Cool, uh, everything seems to be good. It needs to be unique, of course, so we loop until we've, if we hit any collisions and we keep trying again on a random number generator. Um, God, here we go. Uh, so we changed our, our flow of sign up so that we only ask for your email address. We want to, to you know, make it as easy for you to sign up as possible. So we asked, stopped asking for your name and a bunch of information. So now it just says someone, something, no, nothing loves guava random digit. And we ran out really fast. That happened in 26, August 2016. So what does a classic speed developer do? Let's just add two zeros to that. And then, and then we'll just uh, ship it. And we'll like, oh, we'll come back and fix it. You can see the date is September 2017. A couple months ago, we are like, why people can't sign up? What, what happened to all our registrations? People aren't, just, and we're like, oh my god. <laughs> this is so embarrassing. Um, so yes. Um, so these are some of the problems that we created for ourselves and, and the way it looks for our particular product. But um, enter Guava Connect. Uh, about a year ago, um, we recognized an opportunity to, to go to studios and help them manage their studio with a SaaS product. Um, and so for us, as a dev team, we're like, sweet, this is awesome. We get to build it right. Um, this is our chance to do it. And this is the, the dashboard. It's not pretty from a front end, but it's fast, and it works quite well. Um, and we started using webhooks and Whisper, strong testing. Um, and we... we I, I started taking a step back, so I clearly didn't have a hand in a lot of the creating new problems. Um, and guys who are smarter than me uh, now build this, uh, these things. And so um, it was really awesome for us to be able to do this. And this is our third attempt at React, uh, React version 15. Um, and it, we spent about a year on it. And uh, recently, we, we helped manage about 110,000 US dollars uh, across 41 studios. Actually, four to seven of them were the ones who were actually doing this volume. Uh, the other ones were just studios that we moved over. Um, but as anything in a startup, while we as a dev team loved it and were really proud of it, the sad thing is, is that two weeks ago, we effectively put this project on permanent hold. And for the dev, dev team, it was devastating. It's really hard. And um, you know, we had to have long conversations about why we didn't, why this was important. Um, and it really came down to the, uh, that we couldn't afford the risk as a company that this, uh, this brought in. Because to be able to continue development would have cost another six months of X number of devs um, and a sales team to be able to do it. Our sales cycle was too long. We weren't converting enough studios. While these numbers look amazing and sound really cool, uh, when we took a cold, hard look at them, it just put too much risk on our company. and so. Um, collectively, we said, you know, this is, this is what it means to be a startup, and we have to bite the bullet, and it's tough, and it's really difficult, um, but we had to do it. And so um, I, I bring this slide in, it's like, why, why talk about um, these things? Why, why do we do this? This is startup life, and we fight the dirty fight, and I want everyone to recognize that and understand that. Um, as startup people, as people who are in Ruby, Part of the reason why Ruby is so amazing is because it allows us to iterate quickly. It allows us to build features very nicely. And we have to balance between speed and sustainability. Um, clearly for us, we can, we can afford a certain level of risk um, that maybe uh, larger teams or more uh, mission critical teams can't afford. Um, and our Guava Connects, our studio management dashboard, represented that, that uh, risk aversion that we wanted to take. We wanted to build a system that was bulletproof. We wanted to build a system that people could rely on uh, and not deal with all these you know, hidden bugs that would creep up in the middle of the, in the, middle of the year from code that you built you know, way long ago. But if nothing else, I think the biggest thing is, um, as startup community, we have to remember that uh, these are decisive decisions that we have to make. And, and, um, and even if you come from a larger organization that doesn't consider it a self a startup anymore, let's say, uh, these rules still apply in the sense that you can't, you can't not move. If you stay still, you're stagnant and you will lose. Um, and so for us, we, ha we, we do these things and uh, we bite the bullet when it gets tough. And so at the end of the day, um, 
going more philosophically, uh, these are the pillars of DevOpsome, uh, learning, transparency, and team. Learning is, is because if you ever stop learning, you're starting to burn out. It's one of the first, first signs of burnout. Um, and this whole room represents people who want to learn. And that's awesome. And I, I congratulate all you guys for being here and taking that step. But not everyone is, is uh, at, the, at the same level. And so it's our job to influence others to be able to come learn and, and join and make ourselves better. Um, and in Guava Pass, that's what we do. We go into React. We go into React Native. We do it over again. And we bring all those learnings that we, that we have into our other products. Right? And this is how we uh, make ourselves better. Because I, I tell uh, the, the team all the time that we might, realistically, I'm not going to be here when I'm old, like 80 years old. And so that means we're not going to be together forever. Right? And so while the time that we are together, how can we make ourselves the best that we can be together? And uh, part of that is uh, transparency. And transparency is really big because so many times uh, people talk about organizations that you don't know what's happening, you don't know why you're doing things, and it feels you know, terrible. Um, and for us, um, I, I hope that this presentation, if nothing else, has been transparent into the organization that Dev Awesome is and uh, that we do make mistakes and that we do fight and we do you know, have to do dirty things. Um, but if nothing else, it allows you to make the best decision. So we, I give you the power to make the best decisions and I want everyone else on the team to give each other the power to do that. Um, and that happens through transparency. Because if you can make your own best decisions, then you can make the best decisions for the team, which then affect the company. And of course, uh, team. And uh, I have very particular opinions about team, and I think um, it shows it, it's, it's shown through a, a lot of times. But um, I think one of the, the key things that we try to do is um, wins are on the individual, losses are on the team. So wins are celebrated individually. Marcos does something amazing. James, something Curry, who's here as well. Uh, like you guys nail that out of the park. Let's celebrate it all together. But if someone screws up the code, someone breaks something, something, the website goes down, landing pages, we lose thousands of dollars. That's not on the individual, that's on the team as a collective whole. Um, and I want you guys to be able to understand that that's really important for our organizations. Um, if you're a leader, if you're an individual, it's um, on everyone to be able to protect the team collectively. And so that leads us into uh, the, the mission statement. Uh, Tony Shea uh, from Zappos, uh, The Pursuit of Happiness, talks about a mission statement. This is a block of text, you don't have to read it. Uh, the main ideas behind it is that everyone in, our, in the Dev Awesome organization affects this list. It goes on for another page or so. And you affect your personal, the way you conduct yourself individually with Dev Awesome and with a company down below. And each person who comes in writes into this. And then we sign it. Well, we're, we'll sign it soon. I, I keep forgetting that last bit. But um, the, the main thing is that, yeah, it's, this is important because if nothing else, it's, it's about the community. And so why, 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 why are we here? And Ruby enables Guava Pass, and I love Ruby as a language. I really do. And Matt is the very opinionated. He makes Ruby enjoyable, right? That's the thing he always talks about. And by extension, that's what we need to do for the community. If the language is enjoyable, then we can also enjoy each other. We're not complaining all the time. Um, and it's really important that we make the community powerful and we empower each other. Um, and so hopefully uh, this talk has allowed you to take something that you, you like or you hate, but take it with you. And please make your own judgments. And we've made our decisions and we continue to fight on. And I hope you can learn something from, from it, take it back to your organization and do the same. Um, so I. That's, that's all that. Um, and I don't want to be pure doom and gloom. So I, I do want to talk about 2018 and the future and all the fun things that we're trying to do. Um, so Guava Pass as a whole uh, is actually growing faster than ever. Uh, in the past couple months, uh, we've, we've uh, grown, I think, by 25% um, alone. Uh, and all the learnings that we have from Guava Connect, that really awesome product that we built from the ground up correctly, we bring it right back into the main code base. Um, and we start fixing all the problems. And that's what uh, December into January represents for the dev team. Um, going into 2018, we're building all our cool functions 
Um, we're going mobile first uh, for ourselves, and then social features. Uh, the community outside of uh, the dev team is actually really strong. Um, when you talk about it from like events that the, the outside team hold, um, different things that they, uh, they, they hold community events, they hold um, all sorts of different like get-togethers uh, for this. And here's a picture of us at our uh, still boxings. Um, and so the offline needs to start coming into the online so that we can help uh, retention inside the company. And this is one of our goals for 2018, some of the cool things that we, we want to build. And so um, all that together, um, maybe uh, you liked some things that I said enough that you are interested in joining. So of course, we're hiring uh, for 2018. Hopefully, I didn't scare all of you away. But um, I hope you guys all walked away with something cool. Um, and so we're looking for senior Rails engineers. Uh, with React, we are completely willing to teach it because we all taught ourselves it. Um, so that's not really a problem. Um, and we've been doing it for a couple of years now. And we think we're OK at it. So. Um, yeah, I think, if nothing else, thank you for listening to my spiel for about half an hour. And uh, yeah. Any questions? Any questions? Um, I, I think, uh, did, James Marcus, do you guys want to try to answer that? Kurt Yee? <laughs> OK, uh, I'll, I'll give it a shot. Um, uh, just like anything, it is, it is nebulous. And it's a definition that you, you define together. And uh, for us, it, it really meant a heavy testing component, um, making sure that our, our code base is, it wasn't full TD yet, T, T, TTD yet. Uh, TDD, oh, God, I'm sorry. Um, but um, every, every feature that we released needed to be a certain level of testing. And everything that we fixed also had to contain a test. Um, as well as we needed, anytime we saw a code smell, we would start doing rewrites as soon as possible instead of let it, letting it live. We have a lot of to-dos in the old code base. Question. Yeah. Do you guys do retrospectives, and how has that involved? Uh, so Scrum wasn't actually introduced until about November 2016, so about a year ago. Um, and it, it was actually introduced because business had such very low visibility into what dev was doing. Um, there's always complaints that well, you guys just ship things and we don't know why or how they got shipped. And so um, you know, the stuff that they requested and the stuff that was built was always different. Um, so we started introducing Scrum pretty hardcore. Um, and Guava Connect was that first foray into doing proper, proper Scrum and doing retrospectives. And so um, we've had like an example of them. Uh, we just go through the things that we did poorly. Um, and then um, any interpersonal issues we also bring up during that time. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bonding time. It's a complaint time. It's everything time. And sometimes they last an hour. Sometimes they last three. Yeah. Using automated tool for uh, checking your code, like code climate or something like that. RuboCop. Uh, we do RuboCop. We used to do code climate. Uh, RuboCop does most of our linting for us these days. Yeah. How about JavaScript? Uh, yeah, yeah. That one's yes. I don't remember exactly because my atoms just set up and it just goes. <laughs> All right, any other questions? Cool, thank you guys.